Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today for yet another edition of the Pure Digital Passion Podcast with Moses Kemibaro. And today a guest, a guest who's been a friend of mine for many, many years, somebody that I've known through my journey in the digital ecosystem of the Silicon Savannah in East Africa. His name is Ali Hussein, also sometimes referred to as Ali Hussein of LinkedIn. Uh, somebody who's built an incredible reputation in the fintech and technology space, Karibu Sana Ali. Thank you, Moses. So it's a I, real pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I'm so delighted uh, to have you as my friend um, and also as my guest here. I think you and I share a lot um, in the technology space going back over 20 years now. And I think maybe we should just start off with probably the most obvious question, which sure. is, can you give us a sense of, you know, Ali, you know, what's your professional and personal background? How did you get here and what has been your journey in technology leadership to date? Interesting, was, But first, before I even go into my my story, my history. I'm here as your guest today, but you also know I do Ali Talks Tech as a podcast and podcast. Yes. So you're my next guest. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so we're going to do a, what do you call that thing? A collabo. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Looking forward to it. So who's Ali? Hmm, interesting. Um, I've been in this journey for the better part of the tech journey for the better part of half, slightly half my life. Um, my journey in tech really started when I was in uni. All the way back in university, in huh? uni. Kenyatta University is my alma mater. And strangely enough, the thing that uh, I did that was serendipitous at that time, I didn't know was going to connect the dots for my tech um, career. So, in KU, I did this um, degree called business studies. Okay. And part of business studies, you required to do an extra unit that was sort of aligned to business, but not necessarily aligned at the executive level at that time. Guess what that cause was? That that unit was? No, I don't know. Secretarial studies. No way. Absolutely. And why did they have it in there? What was the thinking? The thinking was that you needed to understand business English. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You needed to be able to type your own letters. At that time, there were no computers. The computers that were available at that time were huge mainframes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The size of probably this room. Is it the VAX, probably the VAX machines? Something yeah? like that. Yes. So when we entered our um, secretarial studies uh, room, it was just two guys, myself and a friend of mine, the late Wanaina Dirango. Oh, yeah. And all these girls were like, what the hell are you guys doing here? But let me tell you, that was an interesting journey for me because learning to type, speed typing. From scratch. From scratch. There were those words that we used to have, uh, the fox flies over the wall or stuff like that. And, and you repetition, needed repetition, repetition. Repetition, repetition, because you needed to have your fingers across this IBM typewriter. Those, typewriter? Yes, wow. typewriters. There were those huge IBM typewriters. Now, what was interesting then, those typewriters were starting to evolve. So they had memory. They could remember things. They could remember things. So after you finished typing, you could actually go back and print out later on what you had typed. Wow. Or you could go back and change stuff using using a white a white marker that was embedded in the typewriter wow. interesting times but as part of secretarial studies as luck would have it we had time in the computer lab concurrently concurrently excellent so floppy disks hey boss 
This is my iPad. This was the size of the floppy disk. It was real <laughs> floppy. Was it the five and a quarter? Yes. Yeah. So I could trust my journey, uh, my professional tech journey from there. Uh, so I took business studies. I left uni, worked for the family business in Kilifi, then uh, found myself coming to Nairobi uh, to work. I was getting married then. My wife had a job in Nairobi, and I decided, you know, let me join her. Mm. Let's see mm. what would have. So what what would happen? So I got a small job in a ad agency. Long story short, a couple of years later, <clears throat> I worked in the motor industry. Toyota as a market analyst, and I've told this story before in my podcast where working as a market analyst, we had a time when we were tracking vehicles, knockdown, CKD as they used to be called, complete knockdown units, vehicles, Toyotas from uh, Japan into Kenya. And as part of my role as a market analyst, I doubled also as a stock controller. So we used to track vehicles using Excel spreadsheets. Amazing the ERP stuff. of the days. <laughs> Before Excel spreadsheets, yeah. Lotus 1, 2, 3. I remember that, yeah. Not on Windows. On it was pre-Windows on Dot. So I used to do these graphs on Lotus 1, 2, 3 using control shift you know, stuff without a mouse, uh, or, without a mouse and, or anything. It was interesting times. My first experience, a real deep experience with the internet, was when Toyota sent us a memo from Japan telling us, guys, you have six months to shift from fax machines to email. I mean, it sounds it sounds like crazy right now, but uh, you know that was that was super interesting time. So you have to shift from email to fax. Now, what we are not saying that we are not going to be receiving your fax after six months. It's just that it will not be urgent because we are shifting the fax machine down to the archives, stuff like that. So we need to get email. As a stock controller and uh, market analyst, it just so happened at that time, concurrently, that uh, Africa Online mm. were hooking dial-ups. So, David Kiania, good friend of mine. Yes, the one I worked who, with him at Africa Online, actually. Yeah. He was the one who was knocking on doors. Uh, I hope David is listening to me right now. Those are the interesting days. So, Long story short, I got the first email at Toyota East Africa was sitting on my computer. (laughs) You are the email guy. I was the email guy. I was the (laughs) internet guy. Oh, God. Because there was no wireless. There was no corporate connection. There was no land. There was nothing. Oh, even those days, Toyota didn't have a land. No. It is after that when um, Lantec came to connect us. Because now they need to distribute this. Yes, a couple of a couple of months later. Wow. So that's where my love and passion for tech started. Just at a deeper level. You yeah. know, at a deeper level, connecting the dots then and um it was quite interesting because I remember the MD, Malcolm Better, great guy, used to receive every morning. He was a diehard WRC guy, World Rally Championship. The craze today with, um, uh, Sebastian Lowe, uh, yes. you know, uh, Ogier. yes, and with Akina Hamilton uh-huh, and uh-huh. the rest, those days it was World Rally Championships. It was absolutely amazing how Malcolm, every morning, the first thing he would do, he would go to his fax machine. No way. And see whether he's gotten his fax from Toyota Motorsports 
from uh, Germany to look at the rankings. Wow. You know how today we just do it on, we, you go online on your mobile phone, you check the rankings. Those days it was fax. <coughs> so I walked into Malcolm's office. I told him, Malcolm, forget this fax machine now. Every week, every day, you'll get a report from me through the internet. Well, Raleigh Champs, Ali, what are you talking about? I said, come, let's go. We logged on to toyotamotorsports.de at that time. Yeah. I still remember that. I said, yeah. In fact, forget facts. It's real time. Because those, those guys were super good in updating. These the are the early days, right? Much, so much. Very then early days. Not easy to do, <clears throat> huh? But there was a content guy who was doing this diligently every day. So, um, so that's how it started. Uh, a couple of years later, I bump into Paul Kukubo, who we used to be in school together back in Lenana. And Paul had started this digital agency called Lumice Interactive Media. And, you know, we reconnected, we talked. A couple of years later, I joined Three Mice. And that's where you and I we met. We met Three Mice, yes. yes. Yeah, yes. exactly. Hmm. That's where we, we started uh, getting to know each other. And I think it's been, what, almost two decades? It's been two decades. Two, two decades plus. Can you imagine, no? Yes, amazing, amazing. So, Ali, so let's talk about this. Monica that you have acquired because it's so funny I meet people in social networks I meet people in you know digital conversations in various places yes. online and offline and you're often referred to as Ali Hussein of LinkedIn <laughs> right that has become your name or your brand and I, I think you're laughing because I think it's true yes it's true <laughs> so um, for me this is peculiar because I think for the better part of the last five years we know you as the guy who's always diligently posting updates on LinkedIn. You're also always uh, consistently um, on WhatsApp groups and, and various forums. You're very active on these platforms. And it seems to me that really you've managed to build a reputation uh, for all things fintech on LinkedIn, but also just generally as a space. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the role you're playing in the fintech space. I know you have a role in Kenya, you have a Pan-African role. Yeah. Um, it's something that you're very deeply passionate about. But tell us a little bit about, you know, two things. One is, you know, this Ali Hussein <coughs> of LinkedIn, how did that happen? And how have you built such a fantastic uh, personal brand there? And then secondly, this obsession or focus on fintech, how is that, um, how does that come to be? And, and, and what is that, about you know maybe you can tell us a bit more about that so let's start with that monica ali hussein <laughs> of linkedin yeah all i can say it was if you are waiting for a grand master plan to be unveiled you'll be disappointed <laughs> it just sort of happened <laughs> serendipitously but i think some of these things moses happen because you are just super passionate about yeah. So let's start with my passion around fintech. In my earliest days of working, I was working for this uh, marketing agency. Those days, almost immediately after college, after working for my dad uh, in the family business a couple of years, then I came to Nairobi. So I worked for this small agency that even the creatives had no computer. You know, typefaces. Mm -hmm. They used to have typefaces that they used to cut with, uh, uh, what, what, what is the word? Blades. There were sharp blades that used to cut. And then you used to have this plate. You plug in. Yes, every, every, um, newspaper print ad or magazine was painstakingly and diligently done. You know, we are talking about storyboards today, but those were real storyboards being written and being, you know, produced by hand. Back in the day. Back in the day. So, um, my first salary, I remember, 25,000 shillings, 20,000 shillings then. Mm. It's a lot of money. But the banks didn't think that was a lot of money. I shall not mention which bank, but I remember my bank, 
branch was on Lighter Street. Mm-hmm. Three months into banking my check into this bank account, I'm going to remember those days banks were not even interconnected. Eh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, So checks were taken physically to the clearing house and stuff like that. So I'm, I remember going to this bank. I'm account, I am an account holder. Three months into being an account uh, account holder into this on this branch of Loiter Street and withdrawing money to go pay my rent. And this guy, the teller tells me, uh, "Sorry, your account has been moved to River Road." What? I'm like, what do you mean? I said, yeah, your account has been moved to River Road because you've not met the balance threshold for this branch. So they're basically telling you you're not good enough to be here. 100%. Oh, my God. To my face. 100%. And they felt nothing about it. Zero. The guy is looking at me, na macho kavu, as we say in Kiswahili. So... You know, it's funny, but uh, thinking about that then and thinking about how Equity Bank disrupted the banking sector. Yeah. In my humble opinion, before M-Pesa, the birth of fintech in this country was Equity Bank. So, <clears throat> close my account. Literally. Obviously. And I opened my account at, at Equity. Wow. Uh, Equity Bank had started using tech to connect. The co- you could, in those days, you could literally be able to get a loan at Equity within 24 hours. That was revolutionary then. So that really got me excited, Moses, to figure out how, why, Mm. what was happening fast forward to a, to a couple of years later uh, my first entry on LinkedIn was 2006 which is a pretty long time ago and I have been consistent since then going by 2006 yes BST but you see social media has evolved at that time the all the rage was my MySpace. MySpace. Yeah, Facebook coming up. Friendstar before Facebook. Then Facebook. But I've been consistent in terms of trying to figure out what LinkedIn is all about. Mm. So I really was really deep interested because for me, LinkedIn is the ultimate professional network. For someone like me, a Mombasa boy, (laughs) grown up um, in a middle class family, seven kids, my parents struggling to take us to school every term. You are always trying to find that advantage that will give you an unfair advantage. Of others. That extra edge. That LGBT extra forward. edge. For me, the first inkling I got about how powerful LinkedIn was, was when I got a message. I'd already started getting involved with the Kenya ICT Action Network then. Mm-hmm. Just, Internet, huh? yes. yes. Just as a you know, today I'm the chairman of the uh, Kenya uh, of the Kitanet Board of Trustees. But then I was just an enthusiast, guys, guy who was interested in looking at how we interact with government in the tech space and stuff like that. Now, I got a message on LinkedIn by some senior guy at Google. What Google Global? Yes asking me whether I'll be interested in speaking on matters to do with um, internet governance, uh, internet uh, net neutrality stuff, because I was very passionate about that before even FinTech. 
I'm like, what? And he tells me, um, this event is the Internet Governance Forum, which is the first time I've heard of that forum, which is a UN forum organized to discuss internet governance. And this event is in Azerbaijan, Baku, <laughs> Azerbaijan. All expenses paid. Literally, because of seeing content on LinkedIn. Exactly. Unbelievable. So you had an all expenses trip all expenses covered by trip Google to be at this internet covered forum. Covered by Google to be at this internet forum. Per diem paid. You know, everything paid. I'm like, what? This platform is the great equalizer from a professional perspective. That for me was the aha moment. The light bulb just went off. Absolutely. And I have been consistent since then. So what is it that you post on LinkedIn that gets so many people tuned in? I think the other day we met for lunch and you told me about the way you were in Lagos and you walked into a, a chemist and the person at the counter knew who you were from LinkedIn. That shocked me, Moses. And that <laughs> uh, was, um, was a humbling moment for me. I was, I was in Lagos for an event, yeah. another ex full expenses paid event because somebody contacted me through LinkedIn. Yet again? It happens. It happens. You're not I'm even phased anymore. No, it's I'm not phased. I mean, this, yeah. this, I have traveled the world literally because of my engagement on LinkedIn. So I walk, I wasn't feeling well and I was almost not taking the trip back. So I walk into this chemist at the Lagos International Airport. And this lady looked at me and said, I know you. Lagos International Airport, young girl. I know you. You're Ali Hussein from LinkedIn. Exactly that phrase. Exactly that phrase. <laughs> That's why I laughed. Ali because from LinkedIn. Yes. I'm like, yes. Said, you're the fintech guy. You're the guy <laughs> who... The fintech follows him. Yes. 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 So for me, the deep lesson around... LinkedIn is simple. Social media is the greatest equalizer from a professional perspective ever this world has spawned. It has its minuses because people misuse it for sure. The trolls, you know. Yeah, but it has derived such a bad reputation that people have forgotten the good. All you hear now is the bad. This connection of people, of like mind, it reminds me of uh, Anderson's The Long Tail. Remember that mm -hmm, book we read, mm -hmm. The Long Tail? Mm -hmm. How because of the growth of um, uh, computing and cloud computing, um, a guy in Kitengela in Nairobi can get a global following simply because you're talking about a niche and then expounded beyond your country and continent because of how powerful the platform is. So your voice becomes amplified a million times. And more importantly, in a sort of a community or a niche of interest. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, it's mind-boggling, Moses. But uh, one thing that I always tell people, my friends, my colleagues, my business partners, is this. And this I'm a firm believer of because I'm a living example of it. Your net worth is the sum total of your network. And there's no better way to build a global professional network than LinkedIn. Specifically LinkedIn, not Twitter, not Facebook. No. You see, Twitter and Facebook are about people consuming your content. LinkedIn is about networking. People consuming your content professionally you consuming other people's content and resharing it and engaging and deriving tangible value out of it. So when I speak with people, I have a very 
clear, unselfish end to it. If Moses' followers are 20,000 and I post something and Moses reposts or comment, my followers who today stand at uh, 47,500, but I don't say. But you don't say. That's a, some that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a nice small town or city there. Yeah. Combined with Moses's, combined with Mbugwa's, combined with my other networks, within all of a sudden, my content is seen, my professional content is seen by a million people. So I say to people, be very focused on what you share on LinkedIn. Which kind of comes back to the fact that you decided or are very much focused on the fintech space, right? Because there's one thing to say that LinkedIn is an amazing network for professionals, but it feels to me like you've completely gone extremely deep and even wide on fintech. Yeah, So so let's step back a bit with my background about this bank who I shall not mention. I think I can guess who they are, but just go on. Yes, who moved my bank account and the connection with what Equity was doing then. Yes. And then I became passionate about what is driving this bank to serve so many people better. We didn't even have a word for it then, Moses. It wasn't fintech. Fintech is, you know, fairly new term. But I started engaging in that conversation, consuming content, looking at what others are doing, you know, looking at um, the whole spectrum of um, financial technology in the financial services sector. I mean, I can tell you deep history in terms of when the first technologies were used to drive, do you know, for example, Telegram, is the first rails for financial services. Not WhatsApp. No, Telegram. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm not talking about the oh, Telegram. The now. I'm Telegram. talking about the original Telegram. Okay, okay. Yeah? And the organization that started this was Western Union. Those were in the 1800s. So, rich history. Until very recently, we started using a term. So, before... We started using the term fintech. I was deeply involved in the subject. So the algorithms of LinkedIn reward you. It's as simple as that, Moses. Consistency, consistency, consistency in your subject matter, in exploring, in not being afraid to be wrong because we are human. In fact, the more I found, for example, some of the posts that are controversial have the highest ability to drive conversations and to go viral. Yeah. So what you're telling me then is that, you know, if you think back to when this all began, it sort of started happening, that horrible experience, a bank shutting down your accounts. Yes. You then jump into equity bank, you start seeing innovation, Absolutely. you start getting deeper and deeper into this. Yes. Um, and then we start to sort of really talk about, the, you know, sort of the, the fintech space. Yeah. Um, I think you have some interesting perspectives around fintech and even now digital currencies and crypto. Yes. And I would like to hear your point of view, uh, especially at a time in Kenya where we're seeing some locally based um, uh, crypto exchanges coming into the market. Um, we obviously know there's the phrase now that's going around called crypto winter because crypto has uh, declined significantly across Bitcoin, Ethereum and all these platforms. And I'm just curious to hear your point of view around what this means uh, from a Kenyan and African perspective. Because even then, um, I think there was a report the other day, yeah, this is the Daily Nation, the Business Daily, that Kenya has, I think, uh, over 4 million people who are actively trading in crypto, uh, which I think sounded like a very high number, but you know, it may not surprise me because Kenya, again, is the home of M-Pesa. Um, what are your thoughts around crypto, crypto winter, what, how that is impacting the fintech space as it were right now. So, Moses, 
in some ways, this is a very controversial subject, especially in markets where the central bank has been very categorical that this is not something they want to discuss. But hey, you know, I have been known to be an equal opportunity offender. So let me just jump in. <laughs> First, let's look at this from a historical perspective. And let me answer that issue around crypto winter. Crypto winter is something that only newbies talk about. Mm. Please, Bitcoin is today $23,000. It's yes. climbing back up again, yeah. It's climbing back up, yes. It was 60000 hardly a year ago. But guess what? There was a point, Bitcoin was 0.1 per dollar. This is in our lifetime, Moses. Uh, how old is Bitcoin? How old is Bitcoin? I think in the common consciousness, maybe what, the last 15 years, 10, 15 years? Less. 10 years? At yes. Least? So, you are talking the only people who talk about a crypto winter are the newbies, the ones who refuse to understand history. And there's a German philosopher who famously said, we learn from history that we never learn from history. So the guys who are pioneers are continuously laughing all the way to the bank. But let's address why Bitcoin? Why crypto? Why decentralized finance? The fact of the matter that we cannot escape from is that globally there has been a dramatic erosion of faith in the traditional financial services sector. Go back to the time of the financial crash in 2008. That's when you start seeing the rise of uh, the crypto space. Crypto is here to stay, Moses. It will stabilize. It will find its niche. It will grow. You can take that to the bank, no pun intended. So what you're saying is crypto winter is just a bump in the road. It's growing pains more Absolutely. than anything. But the thesis behind cryptocurrencies is solid. Absolutely. Do you remember, if you remember your history after the Second World War, the Deutsche Mark, you, to buy bread, you needed a whole wheelbarrow of Deutsche Marks. Today, the Deutsche Mark and other European currencies have given way to the euro. Mm. How solid is the euro? Euro has become the other reserve currency mm. by all intents and purposes. And I know central bankers may cringe by what I'm about to say, but by all intents and purposes, Bitcoin has become the reserve currency of crypto. Ethereum. And story for another day, but there is obviously a lot of quacks playing and in that space, but so are many quacks in the regular traditional financial services space. Just regular scammers. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, the way we used to say if you wanted um, rather Windows had some of the most attacks um, you know, in the computer space and open source, nobody used to bother about it. Why? Because at that time, Windows it was dominant. It was dominant. So everybody was trying to find uh, where the vulnerabilities are. This is the same across industries, Moses. Just history repeating it's itself. History Disruption repeating itself. And the state, what is it, the incumbents struggling against the Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've got to ask you this question because yes, I know Moses. you straddle both the worlds of fintech and banking. I yes. know you have strong relationships across the, the chasm. Yes. And banks versus fintechs, right? Yes. I mean, how does this end? You know, can they be frenemies? Can they be um, able to work together? Do they work together? Um, but what is very clear, even in Kenya, is that there's definitely 
tensions and concerns and uh, and sort of a, a chasm between the two with the incumbents obviously feeling that they have the birthright to keep their customers and then the disruptive fintechs coming in and eating their lunch so what are your thoughts around that dynamic maybe within the Kenyan so, context so Moses is a very interesting question for me and the tensions will continue but one thing i can tell you is this some banks today are disrupting the disruptors how are they doing that okay i'll come to that for one minute in one minute what is happening and as we move deeper into this space you realize and appreciate the importance that financial services is to the economy and to citizens across the world so i quote financial services if the economy was an erp i like to use analogies mm. so allow me to just so uh, an erp is a temp, uh, enterprise resource planning platform that runs computer services for organizations and we all know in the tech industry that an erp's core is the finance module so if the core of an erp is a finance module then financial services is the core module for the economy mm. Mm. hence policy makers and regulators pay close attention to this space for good reason because that's where the store value is in terms of all your sweat blood sweat and tears come in so they must take care of that sector now here comes the upstarts fintechs telling banks uh, you guys you guys need to move aside you're old you have no clue what is going on and in many ways they are right we are right fintechs but also in many ways the fintechs have not appreciated and understood the role that policy makers and regulators must play in the financial services sector mm. so how do we meet halfway how do how does the financial services space work with fintechs because fintechs are going nowhere how do fintechs become compliant mm. we have seen the hula baloo around compliance with fintechs we cannot take the ethos of move fast and break things and bring it in the financial services sector let me tell you one thing for free central bankers neither move fast nor do they break things so how do we do this we do this by working together with banks partnering with them but also pushing a fundamental shift in how financial services are rendered to organizations and individuals and anchoring all that is the concept of open banking so the concept of open banking in a nutshell simply means this moses ali susan nuru whoever else is able to share her information about her financial status bank accounts credit scoring across a financial services ecosystem confidently safely and to ensure that she gets the best service from financial services practitioners how do you do that at the core is apis but these apis have to be how we have to ensure that there is safety hence one of the key cause of open banking is data protection and data privacy mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. hence the fact that kenya has now a data protection law has become super critical for the open banking conversation in this country so this is how we work it we work it by ensuring that we don't lose our innovative thinking 
but also working together with policymakers and regulators to ensure that we transform the financial services sector. So this brings me to probably the biggest fintech of them all. Correct. You know, in the market. We can't go without talking about Mpesa and Safaricom. Correct. And I think in the latest financial disclosures, we see that, unless I'm mistaken, Mpesa is now, is it 40% of overall uh, revenues? Uh, it is no longer simply a service. I think you could almost say that Mpesa itself is possibly eating the Safaricom telco and becoming even more important than the telco itself in some respects. So it's dominant, let's call it what it is. I mean, they control the bulk of the mobile money space, even though recently we saw that now pay bills, um, till numbers and peer-to-peer are all now possible between operators. Um, and I know you're a huge fan also of the mobile app itself, as I, as I am. But what do you think, you know, I mean, this behemoth called Mpesa, which is uh, undoubtedly the biggest fintech in the country and in the region, you know, what's the story there? Where does this go from where we are today? What, what happens there? Do you see regulatory pressure coming into play? Do you see possibly some significant changes happening around there from a fintech perspective? Impesa is an interesting story. And my sense about Impesa is a bit controversial. Uh huh. Do tell. I remember when I said I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> yeah. I honestly believe that Impesa has done tremendously over the years. But I also think that Mpesa is also still leaving a lot of money on the table. Oh. Mpesa is leaving money on the table simply because they have reluctantly taken on the role of Visa, MasterCard all combined, but still think they can still operate without the way the Visas and MasterCards operate. And what do I mean by this? Visa, the big payment Card payment companies are actually a collective. Do you know that Visa is owned by a collective of banks? Ultimately, as a business. Ultimately. Do you know that Visa is an offshoot, was spliced off from Bank of America, 1958. Now, that comes with its responsibilities and its opportunities. If M-Pesa decided strategically and not be pushed by policymakers and regulators to open up its APIs to other telcos to bring these uh, you know, pay bill numbers and stuff all together, it's still very cumbersome. But I would say that's point one oh of where M-Pesa should go or where mobile money should go. Let's be clear. Currently, as a country, we have a systemic risk. 98.5% of all mobile money transactions are M-Pesa. So let's even forget talking about the other telcos. These are CBK numbers. These are Central Bank of Kenya numbers. These are not Ali Hussein's numbers. More than 50% of transactions that are what are known as uh, personal uh, tr- you know, transactions, payments, uh, you know, sell. more than that is M-Pesa. That's a systemic risk for the, for the country. One public, you know, uh, public health company controlling that level. So this is not to say that break and person no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Mpesa needs to truly become an open source platform. So anyone can connect to it, do whatever they want to so, do. With it. Yes, right now Daraja is there. It's working, but that's again point one oh you want to be able to innovate in top of on top of that and mm. i see that's happening now with mpesa uh and i see that that is the right direction to go to go now you would 
when I say that they're moving, in my humble opinion, they're moving too slowly towards that. Uh, M-Pesa Africa, for example, in my humble opinion, should have been operational for a couple of years now. This is just happening now. And there is a push from, for, from policy makers to open up these kind of things. So I would say that there is still a big percentage of Kenyans who prefer to use cash. Do you know why? One of the greatest, some of the greatest roadblocks for truly digital money is number one, the cost of transactions. Mm. Number two, the cumbersomeness of paying with mobile money. The friction. Yeah, too much friction. And Moses, you know, you, we, you and I have talked about this. So as good as the m app is, my last comment about this is that it is the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. <laughs> You know, because it seems you have a contrarian perspective about it, but I just looked at those numbers and I was just thinking to myself, if this thing has gotten so big that it's almost reaching the point where it feels like it's about to eat Safaricom itself, yeah, you know, it almost feels that at some point, you know, regulator, something is going to break, something is going to change. Uh, but at the same time, you've also hinted that Mpesa could be potentially bigger and they open it up to other networks and, and, and make it almost a uh, network neutral uh, platform. Absolutely. Um, now, yeah. if you look at the Pan-African space right now, MTN, MTN mobile money is starting to eat into M-Pesa's uh, markets. As an alternative. As an alternative. In fact, in some, in some cases, if you look at the numbers, they're neck to neck. In some cases, if you look at some of the metrics, MTN is already ahead. In certain key markets. In certain key markets. Wow. Um, the fact that M-Pesa is not in Nigeria is a big red flag. That's the largest market. MTN is dominant there. It's just a matter of time. Then there's a new player that is telco agnostic with mobile money. Mm. Watch that. And they've been Watch. watching mostly in remittances, right? Yeah, remittances, but they are growing. They have a $290 million war chest they've just raised in the last couple of months. They're mostly in West Africa, and they are our neighbors here in Uganda. They're coming. They're coming. One interesting thing that mobile money operators need to appreciate and understand is that there may be telcos, but they're playing the financial services game. Now, they have disrupted the space for sure, but they have disrupted it from a personalized and small business perspective. For you now to enter the real big leagues, you must start behaving like a proper financial services royals. Mobile money is the de facto financial services royals across Africa. Are they taking it to the next level? Or are we going to see the incumbents like Visa and MasterCard jump onto the bandwagon because they understand the game? This is a game of innovation, new thinking, and all thinking all put together. Why do I say all thinking? I say all thinking because you must be deep you must deeply understand the policy and regulatory factors the drive financial services. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You must have a seat at the table when conversations are being discussed or you'll find yourself on the menu. So what you're saying is it almost seems to reflect, and I may not say their names, but we have some fintechs that have been in the media recently that might have been operating locally without licensing. There are some fintechs that they're saying that maybe have been laundering money. In fact, the other day I saw an announcement that... Um, some of these virtual cards are now being disabled because there's some compliance issues. So there's a major, apart from, I mean, look, we, we, we can say their names. Yeah. Flutterwave has been in the news about compliance issues. Yes. So let's not condemn them because the issues are in court. But financial services, in essence, is a game of trust. When you start messing up your brand like that, 
Do you think you can survive in the long term? That's one. Two, the other one. This is why I'm saying you must blend the new and the old and understand financial services methods. So these issues of these virtual cards being shut down, there's one supplier, Union 54. So it's a white label kind of a solution. You know, Union 54 is a fintech based in Zambia. Uh-huh. That has a partnership with one of the card companies. I shall not mention their names. The problem is a regulatory one. Fraud, fraud has become a major issue. Why has fraud become a major issue? It's not that fraud is not a major issue in incumbent financial services organizations like banks and insurance companies. But the banks will not be shut down because we know for a fact that fraud will continue to happen. But these guys have mitigating factors. They have clear fraud um, mitigating strategies. Mm -hmm. They have clear anti-money laundering policies and regulations that are approved by the regulators. Fintechs don't care about that until very recently. <laughs> and that's a problem. It's a rude, wake, a rude awakening. Huge speak. rude awakening, which is why I said move fast and break things done work in the financial services sector. But I think it comes back to the nature of trust. I think the thing you just said earlier, and I, I find myself going back to Chase Bank here in Kenya when, you know, they essentially were taken out of business because, you know, people didn't trust their money was safe there. Correct. Um, it's just a reflection of the fact that trust is at the heart of financial services. Correct. Which brings me to my next point, actually, Ali. And, and I'm just trying to think from you, you know, when you sort of look forward, you know, two to five years from where we are today, fintech, banking, financial services, insurance, BFSI, I think is the acronym that we often use. When you're looking through that lens from a fintech perspective, where is all this going in Kenya, Africa, globally? And how is it going to transform the consumer and business stroke organization perspective? Very interesting question. My answer is look at one fintech called Stripe. Is it Strip? Stripe, I think Stripe, Stripe. yes. Stripe, look at Stripe. That's where financial services is going. Maybe we break that down. What's happening at Stripe? So Stripe has built an API that is so easy to plug in even your grandmother can do it. Well, if she's a techie, maybe. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's plug and play. It's really easy. It's really easy. That's where financial services is going. So there's a term in, in fintech that we, we, call, uh, we use very openly, banking as a service. So banking as a service is a blend of APIs connecting different segments of that software that drives financial services and regulatory smarts. Banking as a service. As far as I'm concerned, and you probably have heard it from me first, today it is we need to think beyond banking and start talking about financial services as a service. So bus is out, FAS is in. And that means cutting across everything. Cutting across financial services from banking to insurance to wealth tech to... The mobile money thing. To mortgages, to mobile money. Now, the platform or the startup, or the bank, or the entrepreneur that is going to win this game is the one that thinks like that. And the closest I see worldwide that people have started, the company has started to think like that is Stripe. And didn't Stripe acquire a Nigerian fintech, if I'm not wrong? They did. Was it Paystack? Paystack. Paystack. $200 million cash. So basically, they're sort of building the future of financial services. You don't hear much of the power them. Eh? 
in the background huh? they don't hear much about them they are just building and raising 100 billion dollars valuation last wow. time i checked a couple of days ago wow so when you're not doing fintech and when you're not on linkedin ali because you seem to be there all the time what does ali do in life what do you how do you chill out how do you take it easy how do you disconnect from this world of i read a lot things, fintech yeah i read a lot um i spend a lot of time with my two last ones my daughters aisha and ayana uh i call them my nssf babies <laughs> they keep me young uh-huh. i spend time with with family uh-huh. i love to cook uh every 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 so two weeks or so i do a proper cookout at home invite friends i love to do my tikka in the you know in the garden at home um football spend, do you watch any football teams you're a football guy unfortunately i have stopped watching soccer diligently uh, a couple of years back i've had to divide my time i'm a super busy guy so when i'm relaxing am i reading am i with family or am i watching soccer you've had to prioritize i've had yeah. to prioritize yeah. so i prioritize i do a lot of reading uh to the extent that sometimes my wife complains well that you know i'm not giving enough time so i'm trying to also sort of balance that so a friend of mine told me something very fundamental about work life balance Tommy Ali forget work life balance this 2022 is work life integration you got to make it all work together got to make it all work together how do you integrate that without either one of them suffering so we must find a balance in the work life integration mm. not work life balance what do you do around paying it forward how do you see yourself giving back because i mean you've had an incredible career you you sort of managed to position yourself as somebody who's highly regarded in the fintech and financial services space integrated with technology what are the things that you do to sort of pay it forward several ways and i break it down into institutional and personal mm-hmm. institutional is i spend 15% of my professional time dealing with policy and regulatory matters. Oh, yeah. I chair the board the board of trustees of the Kenya ICT Action Network, uh-huh. which is an ICT policy uh, think tank focused on Kenya but we can see our the effects of what we do are now becoming both regional and global. We have many fast at um, at Kicktonet uh we are deeply involved in policy matters on ICT and tech okay so i spend time there um i've also i'm also the founding chair of the association of fintechs in kenya still very young but we are seeing lots of so we engage on ensuring that fintechs are integrated into the uh, formal financial services sector so was acting as a bridge of sorts. Absolutely. Yeah. I also recently uh, nine months ago uh, was elected to be an executive board member of the Africa Fintech Network which is an umbrella body of national fintechs across Africa. So that's the institutional my giving my paying it forward. Okay. A lot of times some of these jobs are thankless they then you're not paid a salary mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know but i feel deeply that what i do there affects my businesses the businesses that i'm involved in and also help other businesses r- navigate the policy and regulatory uh, maze mm. individually i still mentor tech entrepreneurs to date aha uh-huh. I you have sit down you guide them. Yes, I have three at any given time over a 3 to 6 month period. Some of them I have uh, in, then invested in their businesses. Um I think I know at least one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Then um 
from a family perspective, we also have a lot of young uh, professionals coming in. So I have a lot of engagements with family. As we always are reminded, charity begins at home. So mm. I do that. So Moses, the thing that I want to say is that I'm super blessed to be doing the things that I love to do every morning. Every day is a new day, different things. I am absolutely blessed by that. I thank the good Lord uh, for giving me that opportunity to live a um, fruitful and full life. Ali, thank you so much for sharing. I'm really grateful we got to do this. Man, it's All it's these a pleasure. Insights and, and you know, learning even more and more about the fintech space. And, you know, I just want to wish you all the best. We look forward to seeing you Asante continue sana. to be so vibrant on LinkedIn. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, sort of furthering the cause and the agenda for the fintech space in this country and beyond. Absolutely. And, and I'm wishing you all the best and really hoping to see more and more um, leadership insights coming from you as far as fintech in Kenya and Africa is concerned. Moses, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this invite. Just to leave once one one last nugget for your absolutely your your listeners. Did you know that if you post only once a week on LinkedIn, you are among the top one percent of people who engage on LinkedIn? Really? Yep. Well, I know I do it at least three to four times a day. So there we go. That's it. <laughs> Asante Thanks sana. so much, and, and we look forward to having you here, and I look forward to coming to your podcast. Yes, you'll be getting future. an invite soon. Excellent. Thanks, Thank Moses. You. Cheers. Okay. Bye.